natural resources and our fund managers. Uh, she got her bachelor from the University of Virginia in 1996, and then her master in civil and environmental engineering from the in 1998. Then another master, but this time in Applied Environmental Academy in the University of London in 2005. And finally, her PhD from uh, Stanford University in Environmental and Natural Resources. Um, she is an ecologist but economist. Uh, her research interests are in natural or environmental accounting, policy analysis, and environmental and economic impact assessment. Thank you, Yvonne. No, thank you. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks very much. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about a, a relatively new research program that's happening in my lab. I've been at UH for about two and a half years. Um, and uh, uh, the, the project um, is on the rich to reef modeling of ecosystem services in order to support conservation and management in Hawaii. Um, so before I get launched in, um, a huge mahalo to uh, collaborators and funders. So we're working um, with people at the USGS. We're also funded by the Department of Interior. Um, the USDA has given us um, some money. Um, the NOAA as well. Uh, and so we are very fortunate to um, have some funding for grad students. Our partners are the West Maui Ridge Reef Initiative, which I'll be talking to you about, Pacific Risa, um, the Natural Capital Project at uh, Stanford University, among many others. So to get you uh, get us started, we're going to be talking about a case study in West Maui. There are five watersheds that um, I'll be uh, modeling, and they're up here on the on the head of Maui. If you're familiar with the head and shoulders of the head of Maui. Um, these watersheds are characterized by uh, land use and land cover change. So. From the view from the shoreline, um, it's a tourist destination. You've got massive amounts of uh, um, um, capital investment and tourism industry along the shore. Um, back in the back is was uh, active agricultural land up until 2009 when the pineapple uh, left. Prior to that, it was sugar. And now it's fallow. Um, all of the ag land is fallow, except for, you can barely see in the back here, um, some coffee plantations. So this is the, uh, the way agricultural land is staying. Agricultural in the area are million dollar homes and to, of gentlemen farmers stuck between uh, coffee plantations. So you have this beautiful view of coffee all around here. Um, expensive home. And then up at the top we've got the uh, uh, West Maui Mountain Alliance Protected Area Conservation District. Um, it's inaccessible, uh, most of it, to keep the native species native up there. Human use of the land, the land cover change, is causing um, land-based source pollutants, um, a lot of sedimentation to reach the coast. Um, along with that sediment comes from a lot of many nutrients and contaminants. Um, the ag land has uh, a lot of legacy out. And as a result, there have been some problems with the coral reefs. Uh, this is a, actually a picture from um, more south in the Maui, but you see the, the invasive algae growth on the coral reef. So the problem we're um, trying to address here, this, is a, this was of great concern. So this is a, a graphic from the Department of Aquatic Resources showing coral reef cover decline between 95 and 2005. Um, and this is our study site area up here between Hakiti and Honolulu, actually it's kind of between the Haina here. Um, and NOAA prioritized this site because of these coral reef declines. The economy is highly dependent on the state of the coral reef for the tourism as well as for local fisheries. Um, they actually put in place right here in Hakiti a, a fisheries management area, an herbivore fisheries management area. Um, and there are other people in the audience who can talk much more with you about the results of those. But um, NOAA prioritized this as a, they wanted to start doing watershed management in order to specifically improve the coral reef state. Um, and thus was formed the uh, West Maui Ridge Reef Initiative. 
Um, their goal is to restore coral reef health and associated ecosystem services, that's my addition, um, through watershed management. So they're looking land to the land in order to improve the, the marine system. It's a, uh, the, the Rich to Reef Initiative is a collaboration between <coughs> federal agencies, state agencies, county agencies, the private sector, and civil society. So the, the steering group um, has uh, people on it from the EPA, from NOAA, um, from Maui Land and Pine, from the tourism board um, in the area, etc. And as any good research um, in this kind of setting, the first thing we've been doing really is just talking story with a lot of people. So we've, um, we've connected with the Rich to Reef group. Um, um, we've gone canoeing with some cultural practitioners. This is the team um, poorly paddling. All of their paddles are in different directions, but we won't go there. Um, paddling uh, at, a, um, at sunset with a Kolo Lindsay, who um, he does a lot of work on restoring some of the cultural ecosystem services in the watershed, some of the farming practices, the medicinal plants, and these sorts of things. Um, here we're walking around with the head of the West Maui Mountain Alliance, Chris Brocious, and John Stock, a geologist from the USGS, to get an idea of what's really happening in the watershed and what the processes are. And the questions that people are raising um, are related, first and foremost, to sediment. Asking questions like how land use change um, alters sediment loads, what the main sources of sediment are, what the impacts are of invasive species on sediment loads, things like there's, there's a real problem with ungulates. Um, there's also a problem with the invasive species of, of dirt bikers who illegally dirt bike up onto the, on the ridges and cause a lot of erosion processes. They're asking questions like, what are the most effective management options to reduce sediment loads to the coast? In terms of the water resources, uh, particularly upland, they're managing their land for biodiversity and groundwater recharge. So they want to know how um, land use will alter groundwater recharge and water quality. What areas are the most important for groundwater recharge? What are the impacts of these invasive species on the ability of the landscape to recharge our aquifers? Um, and what are the management options that are most effective if what we're managing for is groundwater? The coral reef folks. They're asking questions like, how is the coral reef health impacted by stressors such as sediment, nutrients, and climate change? And how will the provisioning services, like fisheries and the regulated services, uh, the cultural services, um, like tourism, change in response to watershed management scenarios? They're also looking at the coastal protection. So reefs provide um, a buffering uh, of the coastline. So they want to know how do reefs affect the nearshore wave processes and how do changes in the health of the reef affect coastal erosion and inundation. So these are the management questions that really drove the project. Um, so what we set out to do was develop a tool that can link the biophysical processes across the terrestrial and coastal environments, as well as the social and ecological systems. So we weren't just interested in being able to give biophysical indicators. We wanted to know how this impacts human well-being and how human use impacts the biophysical, so the dynamics of the system. Um, and this is a, a, a cool painting that a, an artist did for one of our students um, of kind of representing all the different aspects of the watershed and human use of the watershed. So the human use of the watershed. When I say ecosystem services, how many of you are familiar with the concept? Right. So it's the idea that nature provides humans with benefits. Things that we don't think about necessarily, things that we don't necessarily manage for, and things that we don't have to pay for. Right? Fisheries are an example. Fresh water, clean water, flood protection, coastal protection. These, are the, these all improve our well-being, and without them, we would have to replace them with something else, right? We'd have to go to the supermarket if we couldn't fish. We would have to build sea walls if the coast coral reef wasn't there to protect us from waves, right? So they can be really important for uh, human well-being. And we, when we're managing, we're really managing, from an economic perspective, we're really managing these services. 
We care less about the biophysical aspects of it. What we care about is how we translate into human well being. So our overall project goal is to support reach to reef management. The first step is to predict how land use and climate change will impact a variety of ecosystem services. Second, to locate the ecosystem service hotspots, cold spots, and conflict zones. So here what I'm talking about is on the landscape, you may have places that provide quite a lot of multiple ecosystem services, right? And you might want to target management to those or prevent or restoration or prevent development in areas that are hot spots. Whereas cold spots, where you're not necessarily getting a lot of groundwater recharge or biodiversity, um, those might be areas that you are you allow development to occur or, or change in the land cover. Conflict zones. You may have places where some people really value one ecosystem service and other people value another, and they're directly opposed to one another. One goes up and the other one goes down, right? So quantification can help you identify all of these in the landscape. Third, to identify a range of complex trade-offs and win-wins. So if we know where these hot spots, cold spots, conflict zones are, we can start to talk about um, the groups of people uh, that are potentially trading off between ecosystem services, the different, the different services being traded off, and hopefully come up with win-win opportunities where everybody's better off. We can devise cost-effective management, management strategies, and I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more, but the idea is that if we can, uh, if we can estimate the cost of management in, in some way, whether it's in dollar terms or amount of land you have to restore or something like this, and you can map how much of an ecosystem service benefit you get from that, then we can use, we can get the best bang for our buck in terms of management outcomes. And finally, uh, ideally, a tool like this can facilitate stakeholder involvement. We can run scenarios, people can ask, well, what if we do this instead of this? Um, and we can start a stakeholder engagement process to come up with watershed scale management. So the project objectives are to build an ecosystem service decision support tool that can map, quantify, value in both dollar and non-dollar terms, and simulate change in the flow of ecosystem services under alternate scenarios. So, and this drives me crazy. On my Mac, it's a four, and every time I put it on a PC, it's a three. So it's a mysterious <laughs> Mac PC um, bug. Um, anyway, there are four steps, and you'll have one, two, three, three multiple times, which is very annoying. But the first is the biophysical modeling. Um, which I'll step us through uh, looking at the sediment, the hydrology, the coral reef ecology, and the near shore processes. The second is translating the biophysical model outcomes into benefits to humans. So that's that translation into ecosystem services. The third phase is to do the valuation, um, changing the benefits to humans into um, the value to humans in terms of their well being. And the fourth step is the decision support tool, uh, running scenarios and trade-off analyses. So let me step us through this. On the sediment and hydrology, the approach here is to um, select, validate, and test biophysical models that are useful for our Hawaiian systems. Um, as you know, or many of you know, um, a lot of the, the hydrological models that have been developed are, are for systems that don't uh, um, don't correlate with Hawaii's gradients. Um, and so a lot of our work for the past six months has been um, really picking apart these models and trying to understand what the strengths and weaknesses of them are um, in order to be able to pull them into our decision-making platform. Um, so I'll, I'll go through a few of them, but it's not just about how well they model the biophysical, but also how well um, how well we're able to use them in an ecosystem services framework, right? It's a slightly different lens that you're putting on the outputs of these models. Because um, what we, we need to be able to translate the outcome of the model into ecosystem services. So we have some pretty specific things that we need out of the model. Um, so part of our assessment is how well we can make that translation between the, the, the physical model and the ecosystem service framework. Um, and then we will be combining adapting models um, and potentially creating new models if needed. 
Um, so this, the part of the problem with West Maui, um, in terms of trying to figure out which model is the best model, is that there are very few data available with which to test, calibrate, and validate the, um, the models. So their approach right now is, is um, twofold. What we're doing is we're, we're looking, we're running the different models with the same input data, seeing what happens. We're looking at the sensitivities and we're evaluating them across a broad set of criteria to, um, to see which ones we think will be the best. So the way we're doing this, um, we divide our watershed into um, multiple sub-watersheds and look at the sediment and the hydrology. For the sediment, we're modeling the, uh, we know the, pro the important processes that we need to capture are sheet erosion, channel erosion, um, and the transport of sediment. And what we really care about is that if that sediment's getting to the reef um, to some extent. Um, most of the models don't, at this point, have anything about mass wasting. That's another thing we'll add on as we move forward. Um, the hydrology. What we're interested in is the surface water yield, nutrient loads, and groundwater recharge. Um, so the student who's running the, the sediment analysis, Kim Flinsky, she's a student in tropical plant soil science. Um, and she's comparing and analyzing um, a number of different models that you see up here on the screen. Um, and you can see some of these, these gully erosions, right? The, the very simplified models like invest they do a, a good job at capturing sheet erosion, but they completely ignore processes like this. Not only that, but as the, the, even the sheet erosion, the empirical equation that's used to calculate sheet erosion doesn't match the, the situation in Hawaii in terms of the chemistry and the weathering processes. We have quite a lot of work to do on figuring out the sediment transport. Um, on the hydrology, uh, Lah Tan, who's an NREM student, um, he's uh, he's going to evaluate a number of different models. Some of them aren't even up here that he's using um, in order to look across the, the capabilities of these models. And all of these models, basically, they, they have input these input data, things like the soil types, the um, digital elevation model, the precipitation, and some of these are really rough resolution for purposes of the slides, but we have some pretty detailed input information. Um, soil depth. Right, so the potential of aquatranspiration, and all of these get processed in the models um, and combined with land cover data. And this is the key: is the land cover data, because what we're trying to capture is if we change land cover, what happens to the surfaces? Right. So that's the that's typically the variable that we switch the most with the management scenarios. With the climate change scenarios, we change the the, the inputs of evapotranspiration, precipitation, and things like that. But so. We have really detailed um, land cover uh, data. This is actually a, a map that's based on um, US, uh, the land fire data um, that has been modified by a colleague, Laura Brent over in Patrisa. Um, so some of the results, the types of results we'll see, um, so these are extremely preliminary, but running um, the invest model, the sheet erosion model, we see that different watersheds um, are exporting more sediment than others. And so this is the kind of thing that we can bring to managers and we can talk about um, with them, say, these are the land use covers, um, and then if you change it to this, you would reduce the erosion from these watersheds X amount. Um, for the water yield, similarly, we can see that certain the green is, is, is high, that we see um, some watersheds where the water yield is quite high, likely due to the slope of the watersheds and the rainfall. Um, and what this model doesn't yet do is, uh, is differentiate between surface water yield and groundwater recharge. So that's the step we're in right now. Um, is this is a really simple model, the invest model, it's a mass balance model. So we're trying to recode some of it, that adaptation of the models in order to talk about what goes surface and what goes ground. Okay, so if we, when we get these sediment and the hydrology models, we're gonna have an estimate of how much water and sediment and nutrients are being exported to the coasts. Um, and now the question is, all right, if we have that, then how can we say how it's gonna affect the coral reef? Um, so
So here, the approach is that we're going to model the coral reef ecology and the nearshore processes, the physical processes. Um, so Jay Delavaux is also a PhD student in NREM, and she's running a model called Corset, which is a coral reef scenario evaluation tool. It was developed for Australia, um, and it has been validated in the Caribbean and the Philippines as well. Um, it's a local ecological model, and it takes um, the spatial char environmental characteristics, characteristics um, and then models the trophic interactions of the reef system. Um, so from this model, we can uh, get up with like biomass at, a tro at different trophic levels. So if we were interested in the lar large carnivores, for instance, or um, the herbivores, um, the model will output how those are, um, are changing. And it enables you to put in drivers from the outside. So for instance, the land-based source pollution will be able to input the, ex the, the outputs of our, our terrestrial models into this model to talk about how the coral reef dynamics change based on sediment loads, for instance. The last modeling process is uh, led by Greg Wanell, who's a postdoc with the Natural Capital Project, um, and he works for TNC, uh, and the student helping him lab. Um, and they're going to be using uh, INVEST um, which is the Natural Capital Projects model, to look at um, the ooh, wave dynamics and um, so shoreline protection and erosion of the coastline. So they're, they're actually testing the model right now in uh, um, Galveston, Texas, in the Mobile Bay. Um, and so we'll be transferring it over to Hawaii in this summer. And the idea here is that um, it inputs the benthic data, so the, the characteristics of the coral reef, um, as well as the um, bathymetry um, and the wave model, uh, then exports the, the shoreline protection, inundation, um, and erosion processes. So once we have these biophysical models, as I said, we need to translate them into the ecosystem services. So what it will why, why do humans care, right? We don't necessarily care about all of this unless we're actually getting something out of it in terms of a benefit. So we're going to be modeling um, all of these ecosystem services. So on the landscape, we're going to sediment, nutrient, ground, uh, water yield, groundwater, um, production from the ag and forestry and, and pollination services. Um, in the coastal environment, we're focused on fish provision, a couple of a number of cultural practices, recreation and tourism, and storm protection. And this step basically involves translating something from the ecological state, so this is the outcome of the biophysical model, into the service provision. Um, some of these curves we'll get from primary data, so we'll know, for instance, the, the actual fishing pressure. Um, some of them will come from the literature, um, and some of them, the services may have to be uh, uh, the potential rather than the actual. So the, um, the idea that we know how much um, service the ecosystem could provide to humans if they demanded it, but we may not yet know the demand of humans of those services. Once we have the services, now comes the evaluation um, step. So we have multiple uh, valuation methods at our disposal in economics, some much better than others. Um, so Gunjin, uh, he's a, an economics, uh, he's an NREM student, but he has an economics background, and Shana Grafeld are the two students working with me on the economic valuation. Um, and we will be, so this is a, a kind of the suite of, of methods that we have at our disposal. Um, the market price, that's something easy to do. Like we actually just did this where with TNC's data today. Um, we look at how much fish is coming off of our reef. We know the market value of the fish market, and we multiply the two together, and we get a proxy for the economic value of that fishery. Right? Pretty straightforward. Everybody believes it. But other, other ecosystem services, things like tourism, they, they start to get a little bit harder. right? We know how many tourists there are. 
Um, we know how much they spend, for instance. So we can start using some methods to start to get at the value of that ecosystem service. But how much that, that benefit to tourists change based on a coral <coughs> reef change involves some more in-depth methods, things like asking them um, about their preferences for the coral reef state, right? Um, so that, that would involve some of the these, these methods and the kind of the light green. Um, and yet other ecosystem services, some of the cultural services, um, don't lend themselves well at all to the methods that we have in economics. Um, and let me step you through kind of why. So this is from a, a report from the, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity. Um, and on the x-axis, we basically have the type of value people attach to an ecosystem service, right? Things that are marketable commodities like fish versus on the opposite end of the spectrum, these deep ethical values, non-use values, like the fact that I, I think it's extremely cool that the Galapagos exists. Right? I'll, never, I'll probably never go there. I never really see six, so I don't think that I'm going to the Galapagos. Right? But it's, I, I'm still, it still improves my well-being just knowing they exist, right? So this could, this could be kind of over here in the non-use value. The deep ethical value is things like, you know, I'm, I'm proud of my cultural heritage, right? And my cultural heritage is tied to my use of the coast, right? And I wouldn't trade it off for anything. I, I mean, I, I can't even imagine trading that off for anything or telling you how much it's worth, right? So we start with those kind of deep ethical values. We start ending up at this spectrum. Um, and similarly with the y-axis, we've got the system complexity. Something that's really relatively non-complex. Um, our methods work really well. As the system gets more complex, um, they break down, right? So when we're talking about ecosystem service valuation, when we're down here in this quadrant, um, we, we can give you a relatively reliable number about the, the dollar value of the service in question. But as we start to move up into this quadrant, we've got some methods, things like choice modeling, a hybrid of economic and, and social um, valuation methods, discourse-based method, methods, deliberative methods um, that we have at our disposal, but um, they're still really, really young in their development. Um, and so a lot of the research of my a couple of my PhD students is testing and developing these valuation methods. Um, okay, so number four, <laughs> decision support. Um, here we get into the scenarios and trade-off analysis. So this is where we really are interfacing with the watershed managers, the landowners, et cetera. Goes without saying that a change in land cover or a change in land management um, in, or a change in the climate is likely going to change the ecosystem service flow. Uh, we may see a change in fisheries, we may see a change in tourism, we may see a change in uh, um, coastal protection. Um, and so one of the steps is to run these scenarios um, and see what the changes are. The second um, aspect of the decision support is to do trade-off analysis. So this is where I was talking about like one ecosystem service goes up and one ecosystem service goes down and understanding kind of how each management, uh, management measure what the return on investment is and what, what's going up, what's going down and what's the net benefit of each management intervention in order to make cost-effective decisions. Um, and finally, having the tool, we'll be able to do this stakeholder engagement and communication. So let me step you through the scenarios that we're initially um, doing. Um, in collaboration with Pacific Risa, um, they have come up with five different land use scenarios, um, and or five different land use climate uh, scenarios. So current land use under current climate, current land use under future climate, and then different growth scenarios. Um, so depending on the decisions of, of, of society, are we gonna follow a green development path, a middle path, or just allow growth, right? Um, so that's the first set of kind of long-term, 100-year scenarios we're gonna be running. And the second is more on the 10-year time frame of the managers, uh, the land users want to know well, if we do this right here in the landscape, if we eliminate pigs from this area, what's going to happen? Those sorts of questions. So as I said, the, the initial, the current land cover data, we've, um, Laura pulled off and modified um, from the land fire data. So this is our baseline. 
Um, for the future scenarios, we, she altered a number of things. First, she altered the uh, extent of alien forest, right, based on um, forest uh, predictive emission species models. 